Hey everybody, welcome back. It's Overland 160. We're on the Spotsylvania battlefield. I'm Gary Edelman. I'm Chris White. And we're going to talk about one of the more notable things that's going to happen during this slugfest that is the Battle of Spotsylvania. And that is something near the outset, and that's the death of John Sedgwick. So first of all, Chris, what's Sedgwick doing here? Um, what, what role does he have at Spotsylvania? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, quickly, John Sedgwick is a West Point graduate of the class of 1837, a Connecticut native from Cornwall Hollow. And he is a bachelor, but he goes off and he serves in the army for his entire career. Um, he is someone who is well-respected in the old army, actually served under Robert E. Lee in the old army. He was his, his executive officer prior to the war. Um, and then Sedgwick comes off to war and becomes a division, and then eventually a corps commander. He's famously wounded three times at the West Woods at Antietam, commanding a second corps division. And then in the late winter of 1863, he is going to come in and he is going to take over the Union 6th Army Corps, which at that time was 23,000 men strong, and it was the largest corps in the Army. Um, he is described as being a tall and ruddy fellow. He would always wear his uh, pants over top of his riding boots because he's an old cav, a cav officer, and you would always see his spurs, which is important because if you go to West Point on his monument, he has his spurs and you spin his spurs for luck. Um, he also loved was loved by his men because he's nicknamed uncle john would joke with you he liked to drink i wouldn't call him a drinker but we've seen his uh very beautiful uh, uh set that he would take out into the field yes. of, uh, his drinking set um and he also liked to, to be around his men but he liked to be by himself he loved to play solitaire um and as a guy who always wore his sword belt underneath his coat um, very un, unpresumptuous, a, a guy who didn't stand on airs and was respected by everybody. A little bit of a slow general, kind of that McClellanism in him a little bit, but he was reliable. If you told him how to do, to do something, he would do it. He's not going to think outside the box, but he is going to carry out those orders. It's so interesting the way that these army commanders, like a, like a basketball coach or a, or a football coach, you know, you, you have these certain people under you that you're going to use for different purposes. And you can think about Lee employing different people as a strike force versus on the defense. And that's something that the Union Army is going to have as well. Now, Chris, you got 45 seconds to set the stage here. I'll, I'll just say that we've arrived at Spotsylvania. There's going to be fighting in this area known as the Battle of Laurel Hill. What else you got? So things had not gone well for the Federals. There's actually a big kerfuffle between George Gordon Meade, 5th Corps Commander Governor Warren, and John Sedgwick. They're all arguing about what the objectives are and who should work for who. So on May the 8th, they call off the assaults, and on May the 9th, there's kind of a lull day down here along these lines that are being established and fortified by the Union and Confederates. John Sedgwick is told numerous times by his chief of staff, Martin McMahon, that he is not to come into this area where we're standing because there were a large number of Confederate sharpshooters. They were using Whitworth rifles, which are highly accurate hexagonal rifles um, with very tight fitting bullets that could get a good spin and, and give it great, bullets, yes, great distance. And the Confederates are up in the far tree line, which would have been much more open at the time of the battle. Cedric says, I don't think there's any need for me to go down into this particular area. Well, <laughs> fast forward a few hours, and they're placing some guns from a New York battery into this area and into this sector rides John Sedgwick. And his chief of staff kind of sees what he's up to, and they come over and tell him to get down. A sergeant he can see dodging uh, some bullets, and this, uh, he's going to chide this sergeant for, chastise the sergeant for, for dodging. And he said, ah, they couldn't hit an elephant at this distance. And he rides along a little bit farther, and then the men again are kind of ducking and dodging. And then he says it once more, unfortunately, that they couldn't hit an elephant at this distance. And at about that moment, Sedgwick stops and starts to fall from his horse. He hits the ground and his staff kind of circle around him. They flip him over and they can see a little mark underneath his left eye. That's all they can see. They take some, a canteen, put some water on it, and they see that blood has bo is bubbling up and out of it. He had been shot through the face and killed instantly. And according to the date of rank, date of rank, he is the highest ranking Union officer killed in action in the American Civil War. And I want to get back into that and I want to close with that. But before we do, I mean, people want to go and see where Armistead fell at Gettysburg. They want to see where Bernard B. fell at First Manassas. You know, so where did this happen? Where did Sedgwick uh, die? Well, according to the to the veterans of the Sixth Corps, it's right here where this monument 
uh, sits, this is the first formal monument placed in what is uh, Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania National Military Park. It was placed here on the 23rd anniversary of the Battle of Spotsylvania Courthouse and the death date of John Sedgwick, May 9th, 1864. Fast forward 23 years later to 1887, veterans come down here, place this monument, um, and this will be the, the monument to the area where he, he die, is killed. His body will eventually be taken from the battlefield to Cornwall Hollow, Connecticut, where he is buried. He was a bachelor. His, his sister um, will actually oversee his funeral and oversee his estate whenever he passed away. And his staff throughout the war actually had written back to his sister Emily throughout the war. Um, and they talk about, you know, the general and all these things and then afterwards send back all these, these words. So this is the first formal monument in Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania National Military Park, even though the park itself is not founded until 1927. Yeah, and you know, from we were talking before the video here in our extensive planning, and you know, you know, he could have fallen there, he could have fallen right over there, he could have fallen on the land we just preserved over there, he could have fallen right over here. And, and our friend Tim Smith would probably say it as, so Sedgwick fell right here like pointing in every direction. And you know, we have this desire to know what happened where, and as interpreters, we are asked what happened where. And the fact is, you know, unless you've got some sort of a distinguishing mark and multiple accounts, sometimes from both sides, it's really hard to say, isn't it? Yeah, and I would say uh, two quick things. Number one, these veterans are coming back here 23 years after the battle. Things look different. You're under the stress of battle at the time. Um, and so you're only gonna see about that much. There's all kinds of different stimulus, uh, stimuli coming across here, you know, your sight, sounds, anything else you can think of, heat. So you might not be at the right spot. Um, so monuments aren't always placed at, at the right area. And it's funny that you point out something happening right here. If you know Ed Bars, I remember a story from Ed at Chancellorsville, which is about 15 miles off in that direction. Ed was leading a tour and you could tell he was very frustrated with his tour group. And at one point he walked up to the site of where Stonewall Jackson was mortally wounded. And he walked up and he said, he was shot right there on that blade of grass. And he stepped back and all these people run up and start taking pictures of it. And I said to Ed later, we don't know that that's exactly where Jackson was shot. He goes, I'll tell you what, these people had taken pictures of everything on this tour. I just wanted to see if they'd all go in there and take pictures of that <laughs> spot, and they did. So, you know, we never always know. I mean, there, there are certain instances we know exactly where something happened. Sedgwick was wounded somewhere down in this intersection. His veterans claim it was right over here. Good. And what I want to close with, because, you know, in a further desire to know, you already mentioned, uh, you know, the the his death from date of rank, highest ranking. But, you know, other people are going to point out, well, you know, James McPherson is an army commander. Uh, and then you've got uh, Nathaniel Lyon commanding an entire army, you know, and then you've got Albert Sidney Johnston, the second highest ranking general in the Confederacy, but he's in the Confederate Army, not in the U.S. Army. So I'm not asking for an answer here. These questions that we get on social media, the questions you want to answer often depend on how the question is posed. And that is the difficulty with any superlative. The first, the last, the greatest, the mostest, and the least are always tough questions to ask because there's all these assumptions with every question. That's why historians love qualifiers. Many, some, perhaps. You know, that's, uh, you know, that, that's what we put in front of uh, many of our comments because people want to know these things. There's something like nine um, army commanders killed or mortally wounded during the American Civil War. And the biggest thing at both armies is your date of rank. When did you become a major general? So if Gary became a major general on March 22nd and I became one on March 23rd, he outranks me by one day. And so that means all the other major generals who came behind him, maybe 200 more, who were, who were uh, commissioned on March 23rd are all outranked by one person because of that piece of paper and that date of rank. So that's where we take that from for John Sedgwick. But even someone with a later date of rank can be assigned an army command to command those per that person with a higher rank, <laughs> you know, in that army. So interesting stuff. We're not gonna solve this today, but keep that in mind as you do your own delving into what happened where and when into who. Anything else to add? That's all I have. Good. Thanks to Chris White. Thanks to Andy behind the camera. Thanks uh, to everybody for watching, for supporting Battlefield Education and Preservation. Hello, this is Trace Atkins. To stay up to date on all the latest and coolest videos, please subscribe to the Trust's YouTube channel. Preserve. Educate. Inspire.